Cool. Uh, first things first, he has very much overhyped me. I'm not particularly funny, and I'm no way near as handsome as a deck, so I do apologise in advance for that. Secondly, after that incredibly eloquent presentation with all the lovely slides and statistics, you're going to get a foul-mouthed boy from Essex who just has a really crappy 90s clip art style presentation. So I do apologise about that. So, my name's AJ Grand Scrutton. Uh, it says I'm the CEO of Delala Studios. Um, the most important thing about this slide is CEO is an incredibly pretentious title. For the last seven months of 2012, I was working out of my mum's garage. I had my nan's washing machine to my left and her freezer behind me, and she'd bring me out a cup of tea around every 15 minutes. So it's, it's not quite as extravagant as the title sounds. So when I was putting these slides together, I still started to think about what questions would you be asking? And I think the obvious first question is, who the hell am I? None of you have heard of me. None of you have any reason to. So I'll give you a quick bit of backstory on who I am and what I've done, what I do. So, has it worked? Sweet. So, I went to university. How many students do we have here? Sweet. How many ex-students are now game devs? Okay, so the few of you that are ex-students and now game devs will know something in particular. That when you're at university, you get told that you're going to walk into a 40, 50 grand job the second you get out of there, and you know, your degree is the most wonderful thing in the world. Don't get me wrong, you learn a, you learn, you learn a lot at university, but this isn't true, right? If you spend all your time at university just doing the university work and not walking, working on a portfolio, you're not going to get a job very easily in the games industry, right? Uh, the degree is wonderful, but realistically, all it is is it's a bit of paper that tells you you sat in a classroom and you did some exams for three years. So if your guy's looking to get jobs in games, make sure the whole time you're doing it, you're working on a portfolio. Whether that be games that last for 10 minutes or one massive game, just make sure you're doing stuff in the background. And if you're sitting there thinking, well, I, I don't have the time, you know, where am I going to find the time to work on my portfolio? D don't get into games because you end up working 25 hours a day, eight days a week, believe me. I've slept on a beanbag in my office enough times to tell you that. But I enjoyed university, I met some cool people and I ate a lot of Subway. Any Subway fans in here, anybody? Yes, yes, right, cool. And in this picture, I look like I'm having a very intelligent conversation. The reality is, I was actually on the phone to my mum arguing over what flavour pizza we'd have that evening. For those interested, pepperoni did win. <laughs> so, besides university, I spent the last 10 years of my life in a couple of bands, I've toured, I've lived in a mini bus with seven guys, smelling terribly the whole time, and it's very similar to the games industry, to be honest, because you're stuck in a small room with lots of smelly guys for most of it. <coughs> Are there any female developers out there? Any female developers? Well, there's a surprise. Okay, so after spending all this time at university and putting all my heart and soul and my knowledge of games and my love of games, I, I left university and after seven months of looking for a job, I took all this knowledge and I finally got a job as an IT technician and a timber merchant. You know, I struggled. You know, I made the mistake that I didn't put enough time into a folio. I spent too much time doing the band in the, in the evenings and having fun with my friends. And so I got this degree with this illusion that, you know, oh, yes. I'm going to be the next Bill Gates with this bit of paper. And, you know, they was all saying to me, oh, this is great, but, I mean, look around you. Like, there's, there, there, how many students were there in your class? So many of them wanted to get into games. What have you got which shows me you're better than them? I was like, I've got this bit of paper. And they were like, they've all got that bit of paper. They were all in that class with you. They all did the same exams. And so this was a big kick for me. This was like, crap, I really probably should have been working on games. You know, when I was 13 years old, I was making awful South Park wrestling games in my spare time, and I just forgot all that when I got to university. But there is a happy middle to this story. Three months after being an IT technician, I actually got a job working for Jagex, a company that makes a game called RuneScape. Anybody know Jagex? Sweet, they're not that popular over here. Great. So Stellar Dawn was a sci-fi MMO. Um, I worked on it for three years. I think it was in production for 10 before they finally killed it off and didn't release it. Luckily, I'd left before that point. Um, got an email one day from my old boss, Enrique, who gave me the job at Jagex, simply saying, look, mate, I'm starting up a new social studio. Do you want to come work for us? And I was like, brilliant. So after three years at Jagex, I left and moved to Bossa, which is a small indie startup, or social startup, in uh, Old Street in London. Worked up a game there called Monster Mind. Uh, worked on the game for about a year. We released it, and then in March last year, we took home the BAFTA for Best Online Browser Game. Now, this was massive to me. I mean, 
I, Stellar Dawn was a lot of fun at times to work on, but it never got released. So Monster Mind was the first game I ever worked on that got released. And I got to take home a BAFTA. And like a complete and utter loser, I was there in my tuxedo, sitting in the crowd. I had massive beard, ma long hair, like even hairier than I am now, believe it or not. And I was surrounded by all these people that actually meant something to the industry. And there I was, and they named out the awards, and everyone else is always polite and clapping. And it was like, and the award for best online browser goes to Monster Mind. And they're always, yes, come on. You, would, you thought it was a football match. We were running around the room, circling the table. There's a great video on YouTube. And it takes us about two minutes, and then we realize that no one else is, everyone else is just politely clapping. And we're like, oh, yes. Bravo. Bravo. Good show. Good show. But this was big for me. But it was also a high point that meant, what more can I do at Bossa, you know? This game was brilliant. I loved working on this game. I put my heart and soul into it, but we've won the BAFTA, and I kind of started thinking, well, I always planned on having my own studio by the time I was 35. I was only 27. Yeah, I was 27 at the time we won the BAFTA, and I was like, well, I guess right now I haven't got a mortgage. I haven't got any kids that I know about, so I can probably start thinking about maybe doing it. <coughs> so I wasn't, yes, good. So I made the decision then that, you know, that's it. I'm going to hand in my notice. I'm going to start my own company. However, I couldn't do this alone. I'm not that brave. At Jagex, uh, a guy came to work with me called Craig. And we got on really well. We worked together for six months there. And then when I left for Bossa, I said to him, look, you love your job right now. In six months, you're probably going to hate it. Give me a call. So six months after that, he gave me a call. I brought him over to Bossa. And we worked together on, at Bossa. And it was by that point that I realised we were probably going to be stalking each other for the rest of our lives. So if we were going to start a company, we might as well do it together. So we paid off all our debts, we took away our nice pay packets which we had and we gave them up and we moved back into our parents' garages and we started our own studio. And it sounds crazy, right, because you, you earn good money working for other studios, you don't have the stress of the management, so why exactly do it? So I wanted to highlight a few points. Money, amazing office and great people are all the things you give up the second you decide to go indie, right? <laughs> I'm sure the other indie guys in the room can relate to this. You know, you, you don't have the swanky Soho office anymore. You, money doesn't really exist. You remember what money is, but you're not quite sure what it does anymore. And so it was kind of like, well, if this is the case, why do it? The, one of the big things for me is I love my boss because I'm my boss. I have been an absolute nightmare to manage since I've been in games, and I know that because... All my life, if somebody had an idea and I thought it was stupid, I wasn't going to sit there and take it. I would call them out on it. And that's fine when it's somebody you work alongside. But when it's the guy that signs your paycheck at the end of the month, it sometimes doesn't go down very well. So now, if there's a decision I don't agree with, it probably is a decision I'd made myself, and there's probably some sort of psychological issues going on. So, you know, being my own boss is great. But the main reason is this, um, and this sounds really pretentious and fucking hippie, but believe me, it's, it, it's so true. The words love and work should never have awe in between them. It shouldn't be a choice. You know, you work for 75% of a day, for 75% of a week, 75% of a month, a year, for 75% of your life. If you're miserable getting up and going to work, you're going to be miserable for around 75% of your life. That's absolutely insane. Like, what is the point of that? That's, uh, you know, and I got a lot of stick for this when I've said this before because people were like, well, not everyone's in the position to go and do what they love. Well, make the position. Nobody's going to hand it to you. People don't just hand you opportunities left, right and centre. You have to work your ass off to get there and don't be afraid to do it. Don't get up every morning and be like, oh, I could probably pull a sickie today and play Halo. You know, you want to get up and be like, fuck, I want to make the next Halo, you know, and that's what you need to have. And... This was something I had started to forget a little bit before we started the company. So I kind of looked back at games I kind of loved as a kid. Everybody play Super Mario 3? Anybody remember Battletoads? Yes, come on. Final Fantasy 7? Shenmue? Oh, it's getting smaller. Goldeneye, come on. Yes, thank you. And this is my all-time favourite game. Does anybody play Day of the Tentacle? Yes, okay, so Day of the Tentacle is the reason I make games, right? I've replayed this game at least twice a year, every year since it came out. I worship the, this game. And the big thing for me was all these games were about these big characters and these vibrant universes and telling great stories, and that's what I loved, you know? I wanted to be a storyteller. I didn't just want to make 
some little game that didn't mean anything to the world. I wanted to change the world by telling this massive kind of epic story. But what my life had actually become was this. Now, you know, this is not a dig at Facebook games and people that make Facebook games. I made a Facebook game, right, and it did me really well. But the problem was, this wasn't what I was about. When I was a kid and I played Mario, my mum paid a lot of money for the NES cartridge, and then I played it and I loved it and enjoyed it. Facebook games took this mentality of, I need to tell my friends every time I do something. I need to keep getting asked for money. Like, it was soul destroying thinking about people playing at home and after playing for five minutes, you need, you need more money to play or come back in three hours. Who the fuck plays the game and then stops after five minutes and wants to come back three hours, right? Like, this was crazy to me, but for some reason, it took me a while to realize this. And I was sitting there and I was like, man, seven-year-old AJ would kick me in the nuts right now. And so that was the kind of step when I was like, okay, that's it. I can't do this anymore. I've got to make games that I love. Games that seven-year-old AJ would play and current AJ would play. And current AJ would sneakily let seven-year-old AJ play so his mum didn't notice. My mum's watching, by the way, so I do apologise for any bad language, mum. So, the number one reason why. Okay, this seems stupid, but this is 100% true. If you are not batshit crazy, you will not last a year in this games yeah. industry. You have to be out of your mind to want to make games. It consumes your life. You're lucky if you can fit a relationship in. You have to have a really understanding girlfriend, which I luckily got, or boyfriend. Um, and, you know, you've got to be ready that some days you'll come in and, you know, you may start at 7 o'clock in the morning and you may go home at 7 o'clock the next night afterwards, you know. Sleeping at the office is common. People will tell you crunch doesn't exist anymore. Crunch did exist. It's not a good thing. No one likes it, except for maybe EA. But you know, the reality is we don't want to do it. It's a horrible thing to do. So you have to make sure you're willing to give your life to games. And it sounds really over the top and dramatic, but you need to it. You need to have that passion and it needs to consume you because if it doesn't consume you, it's not going to immerse anyone that plays your games. And it doesn't matter if you're an artist, a designer or a coder, right? You have to have passion in what you do. I've been a programmer by trade, right? So I've been a developer programming since I was 13, so 15 years. And effectively, if somebody's not a programmer, they look, it looks like I'm just typing a load of things on the screen that makes no sense. And then they hear me shouting about the fact that I forgot to put a semicolon at the end of a sentence. Coder joke. Anyone like the coder joke? <laughs> yes. Sweet. But this is it. You know, I love that. I love these puzzles that the code presents. I love the puzzles design presents. I love the artistic puzzles that I have no idea how to solve, so I get my mate to solve it, because he can solve it. And, but I'm insane. I'm out of my mind, right? I, it took me 28 years to get on a plane. I've never been on a plane before now, and I flew over on a plane just so I could tell some people that I'm insane. That's insane in its own right. So, why not? The one thing I've been incredibly lucky with my whole life and my whole career is I've surrounded myself with this amazing family and this amazing group of friends who just support me. They don't question it, they just support me, right? My favorite film writer and director, Kevin Smith. Any Kevin Smith fans? Sweet. So he did one, he did one of his evening with Kevin Smiths and he did a big speech in this about why not. He said the reason he's been so successful across all his different medias is because when he tells his mates what he's gonna do, they don't turn around and go, why are you gonna do that? They turn around and say, oh, why not? And this is what I've had. You know, my best friend, Rag, he has been there through thick and thin for me. He knows how insane I am, but yet he still completely l lets me go with it. And the whole time I'll be like, oh, man, like, yeah, I'm thinking of giving up my really well-paid job and working in front of my nan's freezer. And he's like, oh, you want to do it? Why not? And that's what you need. You need this support circle around you. Like, if you're going to form a company and be an indie dev... Make sure you're doing it with somebody you love, somebody that you could happily stay in a room with for two months straight if the door got locked, right? Me and Craig, perfect example of that. We'll go into a design meeting and we will shout at each other and it will be horrible and we'll throw girly slaps. And so what will eventually happen is I convince him my idea was better, he convinces me and then the fl it flips around and we start arguing the other side. But the second we walk out of that meeting room, it's like it never happened, right? The decision has been made, the game is better, but we're the best of friends, and you need that. You need to be working with people you love and people that you want to surround yourselves with. <coughs> the best programmer in the world, if he's completely useless at the social interactivities with your team, he's no good to you, because you need people that meld your team together. So, 
The point was, surround yourself with support circles and people who love you, who you love, and who are going to support you the whole time. Don't try and do it on your own. You do need others in one sense or another. Oh, this has no flow, by the way. These slides just go all over the place. So if you're not trying to keep track of anything, really good luck to you. So who or what the hell is the La La Studios? So we formed the La La Studios last June. We officially registered on June 22nd, as you can see by my awesome work in Microsoft Paint, circling the 22. And it was formed by me and Craig. That's Craig looking uh, rather attractive by some, I think that's in Vietnam or Malaysia. Um, he would have loved to have been here right now, but he wasn't invited. Is it reality? No, I'm, I'm joking. He's, he's back in the office working. Actually, he's probably watching and playing FIFA, to be honest. So, who the hell are we? So, we formed in June last year. It's been a hell of a trip. Um, what slides are next? So, I'll give a quick roundup and go into more details. In the course of our first four months as a company, we featured on the front cover of Develop Magazine. I don't know, do they sell Develop in Ireland? Probably not, it's a UK thing. So, Develop's basically the big independent developer magazine in the UK. It's got a really nice user base. Um, we met with them. We got introduced to them by Andrew, who just spoke. Um, basically said to them, look, there's a cool little indie studio just starting. They've got no money and they're really ugly. You probably want to put them in your magazine. And so Will turned up, and Will, the developer, of, the editor of Develop, is one of the coolest guys ever. Not the typical editor of a magazine. He rolls up on a skateboard through Liverpool Street train station, sits down, and the game plan was... Let's do an article about this long, brief introduction to what the company is. And as you've probably guessed right now, the one thing I am really good at is talking about myself, because I know a lot about it. So me and Craig start talking, and we start telling you the same, the same story we've told you, and we start talking about what we want to do, and yeah, we've got all these big ideas. And off we go, and we're thinking, wicked, man, we're going to get a paragraph and develop, yes. And we get an email saying, oh, by the way, just to let you know, showing the guy who's in charge, uh, you're going to be the cover. We're like, what do you mean? And he's like, oh, you're going to be the cover of the October issue, and it's going to be a four-page spread, and we need some artwork to put in. And we were like, no, really, what do you mean? And he's like, I, I just told you what I mean. And I was like, oh, so really? And he was like, yep. And this was great for two reasons. One, our first game, which I'll talk about in a minute, launched in October, so that coming out was great advertising. And two, this is my immaturity showing, a lot of people I don't like are subscribers to develop. And all I know is, <laughs> oh, thank you. <laughs> They're probably watching this as well right now, swearing. And so what I knew is through a stream of hearsay, travelling down a grapevine, is that various people opened their front door in a nice cold morning in October, and they had my double chin staring up at them. And that, to me, is justice by definition, right? <laughs> that was beautiful. These people that had told me previously, you know, you're never going to get anywhere with that attitude, blah, 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 blah. We're now looking at my face on the front cover of a magazine which they took the time to subscribe to. And the other reason October was big is because we launched our first game. Now, cool, I'll talk about this now. Um, when we formed in June, we had some decisions, some decisions to make, right? What platform are we going to go for? Um, I've been paraphrased before, so I'm going to try and word this straight to the point. Uh, when we looked at Android... The problem with Android is it had 500,000 apps, 95% of which were a ton of shit, so nobody bothers looking at the store. When we looked at iOS, it had half a million apps. Lots of them are very good, but a lot of them had a marketing budget, which is something we didn't have. Um, so what this meant was it was effectively like us taking a stone and just throwing it into the ocean. You know, this is a platform we're going to be working with and we are working with now, but at the time, with no money, it just seemed crazy. And then there was Windows 8. So... We looked at Windows 8. In fact, I'm going to skip these slides. So I told you about the fact I've got no money. Uh, we'll come back to that in a minute. Yeah. yeah, cool. So, Windows 8. Now, this posed one big problem, and it's something that Andrew touched on slightly before that he's probably not allowed to go into as much detail. The first thing I thought was Microsoft are assholes. And I said this, and I said this to Microsoft, right? If I, from reading the gaming press, which I'm sure a lot of we do, we had Phil Fish, you know, the, the god of Fez, who was saying, oh, Microsoft are horrible, they're trying to charge me to update my game, even though he took three years to deliver the game late. Um, and then you had Gabe, and Gabe's obviously an icon, and I'm not going to slag off Gabe because I don't want to be shot and strung up after this. But Gabe was complaining about the fact it's a closed platform, etc. 
And so as a new studio, you know, guys that were going out it alone, we were scared. We were like, well, we probably don't want to work with Microsoft. They're not very nice. But it did have a big advantage. It was a fresh market, right? It was, you know, it was, when we looked at the store, there was about 200 games before launch. And I think it only launched with 1,000 at the time. 1,000 at the time. And this was a big opportunity, right? This was kind of like, well, if iOS is like throwing a pebble in the ocean, then the Windows 8 market is kind of like setting up the only burrito stand in the middle of London. You know, people are going to walk past and want a burrito eventually. And we were kind of like, okay, I don't know why I went with burrito. Um, everyone loves a burrito. Everyone loves a burrito. Um, but, you know, this was a big opportunity for us, and it didn't need any marketing budget. But, you know, we still had this issue with Microsoft. They are, you know, they're assholes as far as we're aware. Why would we want to work with them? And we're not going to work with someone we don't want to work for. We just won't release the game and we'll go bankrupt. And then we'll go have to work for someone like Zynga and rip off games for the rest of our lives. <laughs> I don't work for Microsoft, by the way, which is why I can say this stuff and Andrew can't. I'll bet Craig's watching crying at home right now. <laughs> We're going to get sued. Um, but this is it, you know. So there was one thing we had to do. We wanted to meet Microsoft. So it was June we started, and we were like, well, where are we going to meet them? And at the time, we didn't have an idea. So we thought, okay, let's put this to the back of our minds right now and try and focus. And then July came up, and develop conference, which if you can get over for it, it's in July, and I'm speaking at this year's one. Not sure if I was allowed to say that yet, but I just did. Um, it's definitely worth coming over and checking out. Brilliant indie conference. They get amazing speakers every year. Um, <laughs> but no, in all seriousness, it is great. And there's great stands and great games there to try. And we scrounged a bit of money together. And then we emailed them saying, we're really broke. We're not students, but we're just as poor as they are. And they were like, OK, you can have a student ticket. So off we went to develop, or I went to develop. And as I turned up, there's a big Microsoft Windows 8 stand. And I was like... What the fuck are they doing here? And then carried on walking. And I went around for a bit, and I was like, no, do you know what? I'm going to speak to them. In fact, I'm not going to mumble it under my breath. I'm going to go up to one of them and ask them what the fuck they are doing here. So off I went, and I went to spoke to a tech guy. And he was quite polite, and I was like, well, better not get antsy with him, because he's just a tech. And it was Lee, Lee Stott, and great guy. There you go, answered the question, right? And he was like, oh, go talk to that handsome man over there, which was Lord Webber, who came up previously. And so off I went, marched up to him, Oh, hi. He was really polite, introduced himself. Blah, 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 blah. Um, so what the fuck are Microsoft doing here? You hate indie developers, which is probably where you got your quote from, right? And this is exactly what I said to him. You know, I wasn't polite about it, and my mum's probably ashamed of me right now. But I wanted to know what they were doing here. And the thing that came out was he was honest. And this was strange, right? I wasn't expecting this. Microsoft were being honest, you know? Acknowledged the fact that there hadn't been this proper focus on indies, and maybe it was something they'd been mistreating previously that they needed to look at now. And I was like, okay then, that's interesting. And I said to him, oh, we were thinking about Windows 8, and he started talking more. Oh yeah, well we could probably help you with this and this and this. And I was thinking, oh yeah, where's the money gonna come up? How much money is he gonna want for this? I'm like, no, 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 here's my email address. We swapped email addresses. Let's see what we can sort out. So I went back home, had an email from Andrew that night. So we started emailing and went up to Reading, TVP. Had a couple of meetings there, and it was kind of like, okay, hmm, okay, yeah, and it, yeah, okay, this is good, and there was no bad coming, and so I met some more guys at Microsoft, and I ended up meeting a lot of the guys at Redian, from the marketing, from the tech department, spoke to some of the guys over in the States, and the biggest lesson I learned at that point was that it turns out Microsoft aren't assholes, or well, at least not the abundance of them that I've met, and this was crazy, like, I was wrong, I don't like being wrong, but this was a good kind of wrong. So what's the next slide? Sweet. So we sat down and we made a decision. Let's go for Windows 8. Um, great decision. Yes, we finally made a decision about it. Let's do it. Problem was, Windows 8 was launching in 12 weeks after the day we made this decision. And the team right now was me and Craig, which was a combination of two programmers who both wanted to be designers, right? So we then had to spend the next week basically on the social networks, going on Facebook and Twitter saying, uh, anyone out there fancy working with a couple of guys on a game. We've released a game that won a BAFTA. By the way, no one's getting paid, including us. And we thought no one would reply, right? I probably wouldn't have in a different situation. But it turns out some guys I'd met through being in a band for 10 years were actually artists and programmers and had just got fresh out of university. And so I was like, okay then, well, let's take the risk. So we all got together, well, virtually got together via email, basically. We had a chat and we was like, okay, reality is, 
It's out in 12 weeks. We need to get in the week before, so we've got 11 weeks to make this game. So we started the production cycle. We started working on Janksy. And then I got a phone call from the account, my account manager at Microsoft saying, oh, by the way, you do know that the cutoff date is... And he gave me a date. And then I went over to my calendar and I looked. And then there was kind of like these two weeks of work that I didn't have to kind of rub off the board. And it turns out we had nine and a half weeks to get Janksy, the name of our game, from concept to publishing. So what followed was a lot of 22-hour days and strange cycles of us going to sleep and our devs starting work and them getting up and this sort of cycle because me and Craig were the only full-time guys on the project. One of our artists, Dave, would get up at like four o'clock in the morning, go do a postman route, get home at one, work on our game till seven, go work in a Chinese restaurant, get home at 11, work on the game till one, go to sleep for like two, three hours and get up and do it all again. And this was our, what our lives were. For nine and a half weeks, we were going mental. We were just, we've got to get the game done. We've got to get the that game done. Somehow we pulled it off. The game was in there for Windows 8 launch. And off the back of that, Microsoft, through us, through a gentleman's agreement saying, look, we're just going to do it for Microsoft. This will be a Windows 8 exclusive till now, effectively, right? Till now. Um, they started pushing us a bit. And so we were featured app twice, I think we got Spotlight, in fact. And that was in different countries as well. And that was great for us. And then this PC world thing come up. I, I can't talk about this, I take it, right? <laughs> Good. <laughs> I don't want to push my luck here and then, you know, get pulled off the stage by some Microsoft security guard. Um, but this PC world thing come up. And basically, we did a stripped-down build of the game, and they put it in the top, top 20 PC world st high street stores on a massive touchscreen. So this meant if you went to, like, London, Edinburgh, Cardiff, etc., there were massive touchscreens, and you could play Jenksy. And this was insane. I never got a chance to see one of these in person, but I got a chance to see lots of pictures of people I know going, look, it's Janksy! And then me going, yeah, yeah, I've seen like five of these pictures now because you sent them to me from different positions. And that was kind of what it was. But this was insane, right? The top 20 PC World stores had my game in. This game that we'd made in nine and a half weeks with five guys who had never even worked on a game before. And somehow we pulled it off. But the reality is, we wouldn't have been able to do it without certain aspects of Microsoft helping us. We had great technical support. I would ask all sorts of questions, because we did it natively. Natively in C-sharp, just did it for Windows, C-sharp and XAML. I would ring them up at all times of the day and night. This problem's come up, how do we fix it? And they'd send through an answer. And this was a common occurrence. I'd be on the phone to Andrew Daly, Mike Hay Daly, just trying to get all this stuff going on. And these guys that no one had heard of that formed a company in June, somehow pulled off releasing this product, which was getting worldwide visibility. It's been downloaded in like something like 30 countries now, and that's crazy. Like Some of the countries as well, Turkey loved it, Canada hated it. Cool, Canada gave us some bad reviews. But my best mate lives in Canada, so I was a little bit confused about this. I was wondering if there's something going on there, right? if she had been tampering with something. But Microsoft had helped us get there, and on top of all the kind of actual support they were giving us directly, we have what Andrew spoke of earlier was BizSpark. Now, the point I like to make with BizSpark that Andrew can't is that before... Sorry about the TFS logo. <laughs> before BizSpark came into our lives, our PCs had non-legitimate versions of a lot of Windows software, right? <laughs> <laughs> We'd always liked Windows as a development platform, you know? We've been MS fanboys, you know, with Xbox and with Visual Studio for a long time. So we wanted the best tools we could possibly have. The reality was we couldn't afford them previously, so they fell off the back of a lorry. <laughs> Not an actual lorry, because my dad's a truck driver. Now he's going to probably get nicked for that. <laughs> but um, with Bispark, we signed up. In a matter of days, we had, you know, you're, you've been accepted, well done. And then we logged on to the MSDN page. And it was like, here's all the software you have for free. And we were like... You look around the room and you check, OK, this is some sort of trap, isn't it? All that pirating I've been doing for the last, all my life is going to come back on me now. <laughs> and so we started downloading. And we went from using a acquired version of Visual Studio to using Visual Studio 2012 Ultimate, which is usually like 13K a license. And we were sitting there feeling like kings. We're like, yes, check us out. We're a real studio. Two sugars, please, Nan. Yes. <laughs> But the reality is, this is great. If you haven't signed up for this and you're eligible, or students, you can sign up for DreamSpark, which is very similar, go and do it, right? Because we had Windows 8 full version before it released. We've had Visual Studio 2012 Ultimate. We got Microsoft Office before it released, and they were a massive help. 
But one of the big things I want to talk about is TFS. Now, TFS is effectively, we use the version in the cloud, so tfspreview.com. Um, and it's a combination of source control, project management tools, and bug tracking. Reality is, when you have a team that aren't going to be together, that are working remotely, you need a good tool, right? So with this one bit of kit, I would log in, tfspreview.com, put in my details, ajdelilastudios.com, password, password, you know. Um, and then I'd go, and I'd plan out the work, schedule it into a sprint. And then we could attach the version of the code to that sprint, so you know, OK, this product is linked to this. And then you do the automated bug finding features. So VS has this lovely feature where you basically tell it you're looking for bugs. When you find one, you press a button. You can take a screen cap, some video, some variable states that are public to it, and then it uploads it straight to TFS. Anyone that's done QA knows how much of a pain in the ass it is testing the same thing over and over again, then having to go back and check that you actually broke it, taking the screenshots, writing down variable states, etc. With this function in VS and TFS, I've been around Microsoft people too long, look at all the acronyms. Um, you did this automatically, basically, right? You did this, it uploads it, the person who worked on that bit of code will then get it flagged up as a bug, great stuff, fix it, bing, bang, bosh, sorted. And this was perfect because my team were never in the same room. Um, the week we launched, the Wednesday of that week, we went to Game City. So two days before our game launched was the first time the artists ever played the game. And then on the day we launched, we had a big expensive dinner at Pizza Hut. And um, that was the first time the entire team that worked on Jenksy had ever been in the same room. So if these tools had failed us, we would have been fucked. You know? There would have been no going back. If the version control had been muffed up, if the project management wasn't going well, we would have been in a lot of grief. There's no way we could have pulled off a game in nine and a half weeks if these tools weren't there. And you can get these tools for free, like uh, over 100 grand of software in total, right? For free. So if you don't sign up, then there's probably something wrong with you and you probably don't want to be successful because it's, it's free stuff. And it means you don't have to have illegal software on your PC anymore. Music, on the other hand, no. <laughs> so, Lyft London. This, this skips a bit. So, while I was making Jenksy with the guys, Andrew introduced us to a guy called Lee Shuneman. Now, first time he did it, he did it via email. CC'd in me. Hi, Lee, want to introduce you to AJ to give him some advice. Lee's email address at the time was lee.shuneman at rare.co.uk. And I thought... Rare? Nah, it wouldn't be that rare. It must be some sort of gaming agency that got the, the uh, uh, what's it called, a recruitment agency that got there first for the domain. And I googled Lee's name and looked at his uh, LinkedIn profile. Because nothing's private anymore, obviously. Um, and then Lee CV comes up. It's like Perfect Dark, Diddy Kong Racing, Star Fox Adventures, Connect Sports. And then I'm looking at all these projects and I'm like, did, did, did this guy create my childhood? Is, is there something mum hasn't told me? Did she bring Lee into the house to make my childhood? And this was a guy who I'd been playing these games for as long as I can remember. And somehow Andrew, crazy as he is, took this really bad-mouthed Essex boy, and these are my smart trousers, by the way, I'm usually in jogging bottoms, and introduced him to Lee. And I went and met with Lee, and we had a nice little chat, and we got on really well. I thought, great. And then he was like, so, uh, would you be interested in working with us at some point? And I was like, what? And then I played it cool. I was like, oh, yeah, yeah, of course, yeah. Maybe you've got the time to do that, you know. At this point, the money is gone, right? There's no money left. I'm borrowing money from my mum to get train fare for these important meetings. And I go away, and I ring up Craig, and I go, Craig, I think Microsoft want to work with us. And he went, you're an idiot, AJ. You got it wrong. So off I went. And I come back up a few times. And it was around the fourth or fifth time they took me into the Soho building, so Great Pulteney Street. Lovely building, amazing office. And he took us up to a floor, and he showed us some desks, and he went... This is the La La space. And I went, Microsoft space. <laughs> and he went, no, I want the La La to come in. We're like, what the hell? And they turned around and they basically, they've off they offer this, this incubation deal where effectively, and we took it, of course, where us, a studio no one had ever heard of, a studio that formed in June last year, on December 4th, we moved into the Soho office. So from our, my nan's garage to an actual swanky Soho office, they pay us a paycheck at the end of every month. We're making them a game, right? So it belongs to them. That's fine. We're technically contract workers, but we're still Delala. But the main thing isn't this, that the game, effectively, is because Lee was like, you guys are running out of money. Let's give you guys something to do to make some money. So we've come in, and they're paying us to make this game to make them money. But the whole time we're there, they're getting us set up as a studio. 
Lee's exact words were, we want to make sure that by the end of the time this contract runs out, that you guys are ready to go and do what you want to do. If that's not Microsoft, that's your decision. But you know, we would like it to be Microsoft. So this guy from Microsoft, this studio head of a Microsoft game studio is effectively saying, he wants to put me in a position where I can tell him to fuck off and take all the building up and the mentoring he's done. And this was insane. Who does this? Because Microsoft didn't usually do this, right? Microsoft never have done this before. They bought us in-house to make a game that we want to make, firstly, for them, to take home a paycheck, and they're building us up. And it's not like it's a free man studio at Microsoft, so we get a little bit of mentoring. Like, these are the guys we're getting to mentor with and who are consulting us. So, Paul and Lee, who I've already told you about. Something important to point out, Simon Carter. Simon is one of the two brothers that created Fable. So Simon and his brother were part of Big Blue Box, I think it was called, Studios, who made Fable, who Lionhead then acquired. And then he worked at Lionhead on Fable 2 and Fable 3, not Fable or Journey. Um, and so we've got this guy who made one of our favourite games, who's upstairs, who we pop up to, have a chat with, he comes down, hangs out in the office, and we get to learn off of him. We've got Lee, who I've already told you about, worked on Rare, and we're Rare fanboys, all of us are Rare fanboys majorly, right? You've got guys like... Mike, Mark, and JV, who were the guys who headed up the Wonderbook project for PlayStation, working with the Harry Potter brand, right? That's a big responsibility, massive people to learn from. And then you've got guys that have come from like Gree and Playfish, who are specialising in business and legal and how to make money. And this was massive because I know how to make a game, right? I love making games. I think I can make good games. But I don't know anything about making money, right? Like, that's just a massive hole. And Craig doesn't either. So... For us to be getting to work with these guys to help us actually build this business up, be ready to take on VC, venture capitalists, you know, bring money in and then actually make money as a company, this is priceless. And like, we wouldn't be able to get what we've learned in the last four months in like three years otherwise because they're all there and they're all for us to use. It's not like we have to pay an hourly rate for anyone. We knock on a door, walk in, and you know, they're there. And the other thing that was strange is that these are guys that have been in the industry 10, 15 years. Worked on numerous AAA titles, right? But they're still just as inappropriate and loud as we are. So we walked in and we were kind of like, oh, we better be on our best behaviour for this. And literally inappropriate jokes within five minutes, you know. I don't want to say there was dry humping, but I'm not saying there wasn't. <laughs> so getting this experience is priceless to us. And even if at the end of it, you know, we don't choose to go to Microsoft, or Microsoft don't want us anymore... We're going to be in a position where our little studio that formed last June, not even a year ago, you know, we're going to be ready for the big wide world. And it, it's just insane. And the thing is, these guys with this amazing repertoire somehow thought it was a good idea to work with a bunch of deviants like them, right? So I got the opportunity. When me and Craig first started the company, there was two things we wanted to do. All three, technically. One, no blame culture. We've been at companies before where they'll point the finger, that's your fault, you're in trouble. None of that, right? People should want to own up for mistakes. We made a hat, right? You wear the hat if you break the game. It's got to be you know, something you're open to, something you're not scared of, because everyone makes mistakes, except for hopefully my pilot on the flight home, because I'm still not quite adjusted to that. But everyone makes mistakes, and you've got to be willing to be open about them. But the two other things were this. Only make games we would play ourselves. We're now choosing what games we make. We will only make games we play ourselves, because what's the point otherwise? Don't want to ship a title and then never play it. Three, we want to be able to give our mates jobs. Within the company forming in June, we started in December, we got to give two of our best mates jobs. Loudon was a lead QA at Jagex. He's come in as a designer because I'd seen how good his design was, so in he came. And Ben was a programmer at Bossa. We'd worked with him, he was brilliant. We knew he was going to be an amazing lead programmer, maybe a technical director one day, so in we got him. Being able to give your best mates jobs is brilliant. There is nothing more rewarding, right? It's the best feeling in the world. Now, that leads me, in no way at all, to the fact that I've finished. You'll be happy to hear. Um, thank you very much for listening to me waffle. If you took anything from that, if you could write down what it was and let me know so that I could figure out what my presentation's about, that would be great. Um, I'm here for the next half hour, probably somewhere, before I have to fly back to good old London. Um, but if you want to come up, have a chat, swap business cards, whatever, please come up to me. If not... You can email me whenever you want. I promise I will reply, even if it takes me a couple of days. But thank you very much for taking the time to listen.